Good morning, and welcome to the Lake of the Woods Church Online for this Sunday, April 10th, Palm Sunday. My name is Jordan Metis. I'm an associate pastor here at the Lake of the Woods Church. I'm joined by our senior pastor, Adam Colson. And as I mentioned, it's Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, or, or Passion Week, as some churches describe it. And coming up this week, uh, part of what we're doing in uh, for uh, observing Holy Week is that we're having a cantata. Our choir is putting on a cantata on Friday, uh, April 15th at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. And the cantata, cantata is entitled, Once Upon a Tree. So we want to invite those who are in the area to that cantata. There's more information on our website about that. Then we also have uh, on Saturday what's called Silent Saturday. Our sanctuary here at the church will be open uh, for a time of reflection and prayer as we get ready for Easter. Uh, speaking of Easter, Adam, you want to tell us about our, our Easter services? Sure. We have a, a full schedule. Easter morning will begin at, at uh, 7 a.m. Uh, you'll be actually leading the sunrise service over at uh, Clubhouse Point. And so I'll be right on the water. It's always a beautiful time to come out. A little chilly, so make sure you dress warm. But it's always a wonderful time to come out. And as a, the, the earthly sun rises, of course, we celebrate the, the risen of the, of the heavenly sun, the it's Son of God. Service. It really is. And then we'll have our 8.30, our 9.45, and our 11 o'clock services. The 8.30 will be a, our, our, our uh, blended service, 9.45 traditional. And we have some beautiful things planned for each of those services. And then the contemporary at 11. We're going to be just celebrating uh, right Resurrection Sunday. You know, what does that mean to us as believers? Uh, I love the name, uh, um, the name for God as uh, the, the resurrector because he resurrects everything. He redeems everything. Even our mistakes, our problems, our struggles, he redeems them and resurrects them. So we're going to be looking at that together next week. Well, as we enter this Holy Week, we encourage you to join us. Uh, everything that we have going on is on our website, lowchurch.org. We're also on Facebook and Instagram, so follow us there as well. And we hope that you are equipped and encouraged through the service this morning.
Let's continue in worship as we go before the Lord in prayer. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Dear God, as we gather here in the harbor of your safety, we thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for our church family. And Lord, we know that we come together united because you sent your son and paved the way for our lives to be set free through Jesus' death on the cross. Thank you for what this day in particular stands for, the beginning of Holy Week, the start of the journey towards the power of the cross, the victory of the resurrection, the rich truth that Jesus truly is our King of Kings. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We give you praise and honor for the ways that you are righteous and true. We give you worship for you alone are holy and you alone are just. We will declare that your love stands firm forever. Your loving kindness endures forever. We ask today that you would strengthen us, restore us, and inspire us with your love. Fill us with your peace so that as we journey onwards towards Easter morning, we'll pour out your love and grace to others. We ask that our soul would catch the wind of your spirit so that we would take your promises to all the earth. Thank you for our missionaries who are doing this very thing. Be near these messengers of the good news as they reach into some of the darkest corners of our world. This month, we pray in particular for Teen Challenge and Beauty for Ashes. Blessed Lord, your compassion touched all who came to you. We pray for those in the Fredericksburg and Richmond areas who've lost their health and freedom through addiction. In particular, we ask you to bless the ministries of Teen Challenge and Mike and Cindy Zello as they reach out to the hurting in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that your ways are far greater than our ways, that your thoughts are far deeper than our thoughts. Thank you that you had a plan to redeem us. Thank you, Lord, that you make all things new. We pray today for our family and friends who are hurting. You, O Lord, seek to restore the brokenhearted, to call those who are hurting to yourself. Hear now our prayers as we offer them silently or aloud for our loved ones who are hurting. Thank you, Lord, that your face is towards the righteous, that you hear our prayers, that you know our hearts. Help us to stay strong and true to you. Help us not to follow after the voice of the crowds, but to press in close to you to hear your whispers, to seek after you alone. Today, we ask that you would use the words of our associate pastor, Jordan Metis, your servant. Through your word, through the sermon you've given him, through the Holy Spirit, transform us as we partake of this service today. We praise you. We bless you, Lord. We thank you that you reign supreme and that we are more than conquerors through the gift of Christ. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our gospel passage this morning comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, And as you enter enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. 
As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of God for the people of God. Well, good morning on this Palm Sunday. We've come to the final Sunday in our Lenten sermon series, The Words of Lent. And in the weeks prior, we have taken a look at the words prepare, betrayal, denial, prayer, and blessing. And each word has helped paint the picture of Jesus' life and mission here on earth, which culminate in our Easter celebration, our celebration of Christ's resurrection and his defeat of sin and the grave. Each of these previous words has specifically looked at the what of Lent. What Lent is about, because each is something that Jesus went through in his time with us on earth. So especially looking at betrayal and denial, don't ever say that Jesus doesn't understand what you're going through. But today we're going to take a look at the why, why Jesus endured these things with the word passion. And if there's one thing that our gospel reading this morning shows us both subtly and not so subtly, it's that Jesus has a passion for peace and not his own peace, but your peace and my peace. Few things in this world are as fragile and seemingly impossible to attain as peace. Even something as simple as breaking a twig or a small twig involves putting hands in the right place, using the right amount of force and the right amount of pressure in the right direction to break a twig. Yet breaking peace is as simple as a word spoken in anger or out of jealousy. I mean, the idea of world peace seems like a pipe dream, especially these days. A lack of peace invades many of our households. A lack of peace invades our our families, organizations, and even sometimes ourselves. Marriages are filled with with anger or jealousy. Parents and children are, are sometimes at odds with each other, often seemingly over small things. Many of us even lack peace within ourselves. We feel unsettled, uncertain, or or maybe conflicted inside over things such as as who we are. What is our purpose in life? Am I really flourishing in life? Am I really living that life in abundance? There's this new roller coaster at King's Dominion, a a local theme park. It's called Tumbili, which is Swahili for monkey. And it goes, starts straight up, it goes up, and then it goes over and down and then up and then up, up, down, down and over and up, 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 down like this. And the whole time you're spinning over and over and over. And I think that's sometimes how we feel in life. We go from happy to sad. We go from upset to confused, joyful to lonely, all within a couple of seconds. And we'll do anything to make it stop. Sometimes even go into great lengths to, to numb the pain, to numb ourselves and just make it go away because we're still looking for that peace. Because we long for peace. We'd, we'd rather have that nice, slow, and steady train ride. We'd, we'd rather be at like Planet Snoopy on the nice kitty train ride, just nice and smooth. Maybe a little turn every now and again to keep give us some variety, but we want that nice, smooth ride. And so today, I ask you, do you have peace? Where does your peace come from? Is it something sitting on your wall or something you can grab a hold of? Is it a place you can go? Or when's the last time you truly felt a true peace? Or has it been so long that since you felt peace that you would know it if it hit you upside the head? The world is going to tell you that you can attain peace by, by slowing down life a little. Maybe going on a vacation or, or, or practicing mindfulness. And I love all of those. I highly recommend all of those. I would love a vacation myself. But I think, and I think there is something to each and every one of those. Uh, 
And they may be good for finding temporary peace or, or especially temporary peace in, in its, especially times of, of intense stress. However, ultimate peace does not come from places or things. Ultimate peace comes from a person. And our reading this morning shows three of examples of how that person is Jesus. How perfect peace comes from a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. The first thing we see is the destination. Since Luke chapter 9, Jesus has been predicting his own death. Luke 9, chapter, excuse me, chapter 9, verse 51 says, When the days draw near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus starts heading, especially as we look at this as in the triumphal entry, he's heading towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of peace. Cities often have nicknames for either for themselves, they give themselves, or they're given to them. Philadelphia, for example, is called the city of brotherly love from the Greek words for love and brother, philos and adelphos, which I find rather ironic because if you know any Philadelphia sports fan, they're neither brotherly or loving. Pittsburgh, for example, is known as the steel city because it has over 300 steel businesses. Detroit is known as the motor city because at one time it was the global center of the automotive industry. But Jerusalem where Jesus is headed, is literally means foundation of peace. And so Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is his march toward the foundation of peace. Jesus heads towards peace. He sets that as, as, his, target, as his target. And some of us say we want peace, but our life choices say that we're heading anywhere but peace. But Jesus headed for peace, and he invites us to head towards peace with him. The second example of Christ's journey to peace comes in the manner in which he rode into Jerusalem, riding on a colt. In verses 29 through 35, Jesus instructs his disciples to enter a nearby village where they will find a colt who's never been ridden. He tells them to untie the colt and bring it to him. Then they're they're told if anybody asks, why are you untying it? Their response is, the Lord needs it. Simple enough, right? I don't know if you've ever done this, but I, I, I want to encourage you to do this. When I read a part of the Bible, I picture myself in that part of the Bible, both as a bystander, maybe witnessing it, or as the different people in that Bible passage. So I will literally imagine myself standing there. So... In this example, this one makes me a little, makes me chuckle a little bit because we always look at Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. So at least once a year, I put myself into this Bible story. And as I imagine this scene, the disciples head into the nearby village, find a colt that's never been ridden. Well, first things first, how do you find a colt that's never been ridden? Simple enough. It's probably still by its mother's side and yet still tied up because it's prone to wander. Sounds like us a little bit, doesn't it? So they find the cult Jesus has spoken of. And as far as we know, the disciples don't know the owners of the cult. And so they just walk up and begin untying the cult. And so at this point, I can only imagine the owner coming out saying, you're just going to walk off with my cult like that? And here, again, I I can only imagine a scene uh, like in Star Wars, when Obi-Wan Kenobi says to the stormtroopers, These are not the droids you're looking for. I can just imagine the disciples saying, the Lord needs it. And so, okay, yeah, sure. But the the reality is that I'm sure the owners of the cult, as many devout Jews were, were very very knowledgeable of the Old Testament and the prophecies of the uh, expected Messiah. And so they would have known the signs predicted by prophets such as Zechariah and Zechariah 9.9. And that are also included in Matthew and John's accounts of the triumphal entry. But Zechariah prophesied of the coming ruler of God's people. He said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah foretold that the true king of Israel, the prince of peace, would come to Jerusalem on a young, unbridled colt. 
All four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record Jesus' use of the cult, and none of the gospel writers give any indication that there is any kind of opposition to them procuring the cult for Jesus. So for all we know, most owners who had a young cult were just waiting for someone to say the Lord needed their cult, because that was a sign that the true king of Israel, the prince of peace, was coming. Now, some theologians say Jesus went ahead and told the owner of the cult to expect the disciples and give them the cult, and and that's totally possible. That's certainly plausible based on the text. And either way you want to look at it, the point is that the way was prepared by God, either by Jesus telling the owner uh, that, that, that the cult would come and be taken, or the Holy Spirit telling him to expect the disciples through Scripture. And so, What about the cult? Well, normally when conquering kings would come into a city, they would ride in on a mighty war horse or a strong steed. But when a king came in on a donkey, it meant he came in peace. And so now we have Jesus entering the city of peace in a manner that exemplified peace. And thirdly, we see as he entered, shouts of praise for peace erupted. People recognized peace, and they acknowledged it. And while entering the city of peace and riding on a donkey may have been a bit subtle, the fact that a parade of praise for this peace entering entering Jerusalem as Jesus entered, it speaks volumes. The crowds have either seen or heard about the recent miracles, such as Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, the healing of blind Bartimaeus, as well as those uh, during his time in Galilee. And so the crowd has some inclination that peace has come because they shout, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is echoing what Luke wrote back in Luke 2 that that we that we looked at around Christmas time, that at Jesus' birth, the angels proclaim glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Wherever Jesus went. He brought peace. When he was born, the angels cried out, peace on earth. And as Christ enters the city towards his crucifixion, the people cry out, peace in heaven. The prince of peace, entering the city of peace to shouts of praise for peace. So Jesus enters the city of peace in a way that meant peace, and that peace was recognized and acknowledged. And now we're here, Palm Sunday, the beginning of Passion Week, our our word for today. Now, passion, like many things we humans have done because of sin, is something very different than the Christian meaning of passion. When we think of passion, we often think of words like lust or deep emotion, a desire for or an enthusiastic yearning for someone or something. We often associate the word passion with a deep romantic longing for someone. We'll say that two people embraced with much passion. Or we often say that a person is is passionate about something. Maybe they're passionate about their work, their hobbies, music, the arts, or, or even sports. In most casual conversations, I'm very quick to say that I'm passionate about the Boston Red Sox or my Liverpool football club. However, these meanings are very different from the original meaning of the word passion. Passion literally means the sufferings of Christ on the cross and the death of Christ. Christ's passion was physical suffering. As many are are, are familiar with the, the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And Jesus wasn't passionate about pain. However, he was passionate about peace and providing a way for us to have true peace, both here and into eternity. Do you know how to find peace with God? Because trust me, God wants you to have true peace. He wants to give you peace so bad that he willingly endured betrayal, 
Because remember, the same people who cried Hosanna on Palm Sunday cried crucify him on Friday. He willingly endured betrayal to give you peace. He wants to give you peace so bad that he willingly endures being mocked, spit on, and tortured to give you peace. He wants to give you peace so bad that he willingly endured nails being driven into his hands and his feet and suffered a horrific death to give you peace. That's passion. Paul wrote in Romans 5.1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you today, there is no peace without Jesus Christ. There is no peace inside. There is no peace with others. There is no peace with God until we allow Jesus Christ to be our peace. But there's a problem. There's a divide. There's something that keeps us from God, and that's our sin. Paul also writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And not just eternal life, but life of peace, eternal life without tears, and eternal life without pain. And God, in his passion for peace, also offered a bridge for that divide. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's passion. Jesus is passionate about saving you and saving me. And that final step to peace with God, to all who received him, who believed in his name, He gave power to become children of God. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ for peace. But what is this peace? It's a wholeness. It's a completeness. It's a sense of rest for our souls. It's a sense of our hearts being home. It's a sense that no matter what happens, no matter what is going on around me, I have a quiet and confident certainty that everything is going to be okay. That's peace. When we invite Christ into our hearts, we invite peace. Sinners, though we are rebellious uh, as though we have been far from God, We have walked, Uh, maybe even some of us have run from God, despite that Christ came to return us to God, because Christ has a passion for peace. So if you have a deep need, if you want that peace, I encourage you in a moment to, to pray this prayer with me. Maybe you've prayed, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've prayed this prayer before. I encourage you this morning, pray it again. It never hurts to ask for that same peace to come over us. Or maybe you're like, ah, this is kind of weird. I don't, I don't, I don't get this. I don't know what you're talking about. Then I encourage you to reach out to us. You're joining us online. Hop on our website, send us an email, hop on Facebook, send us a message because we want to talk to you and talk to you more about that peace and how you can have that peace. But let's pray if you want that peace. Lord God, I need your peace. I cry out for your peace today. I know that I have strayed from you and sinned against you. Lord, please forgive me. I believe with my whole heart that your son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins to give me that peace. I want to turn from my ways 
and follow Christ with all that I am. Thank you, Lord, for being so passionate about my peace. I thank you and I praise you, Lord God. Because if there's one thing that Jesus Christ is passionate about, it is our peace. Amen.